Good morning. If we haven't met before, my name is Steve Peer. I'm one of the eld one of the eight elders that serve River Oaks Community Church. We're glad to have Tom with us this morning and his wife, Kirsten. Would you stand, please, Kirsten? So a few months ago, our pastoral coach, Newt, Newt Larson, suggested we reach out and consider an interim pastor, and we reached out and started talking to Tom in early April. We had a few video chats with him as the elders, and then in early May, Tom was down here and met the staff and um, showed them around. We had coffee, um, and then last night, uh, the elders and deacons and staff, uh, pastors, we met in the cafe for just kind of an informal time to get to know them a little bit better. And uh, really a privilege to have Tom and Kristen here this morning and look forward to the message that they have to bring to us. Well, thanks, Steve. Well, it's a delight to be here. Good morning, River Oaks. Good morning. Man, what an awesome worship team, too. Boy, this is, this is great. The, uh, uh, just, you met my wife, Kirsten, but I want to tell you a little bit about our family. We have three adult kids and uh, four grandkids. So two of our grandkids, our two granddaughters, are, they live in the Milwaukee area, so we get to see them pretty often. But our other two are out in Oregon, so that's a little bit of a distance, but uh, we're getting some cheap plane tickets to Oregon more often than not, so that's been, that's been good. We're originally from California, so we're transplants. We moved to Waukesha, just outside of Milwaukee, in 2010. So the Lord called us out here. It was a crazy move for us. And uh, a lot of people go, wait, 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 you moved from California to Wisconsin, you're supposed to go the other way, you know, but we, uh, it was God's call. I retired from serving Elmbrook Church for the last 11 years as a pastor there with many different hats that I wore, and uh, that's just outside of, again, on the Milwaukee area, and, uh, uh, but many years ago, uh, when I was in my late 40s, I was a part of a church network in California that uh, where one of our churches needed an interim. And so I stepped in and was their intentional interim pastor for 18 months. And then another church right after that uh, in our network also needed an interim pastor. And, and so I went there for, for 12 months. And I tell you, it was, I was in my late 40s and usually interim pastors are old guys like me. So back, back then in my 40s, I'm like, I said this to Kirsten, I said, wow, this was really a great experience, but I'm a little young to do that. So when I get older, maybe I'll do that again. And so the Lord called us to work with this group, IPM, Interim Pastor Ministries, and that's how I ended up here this morning, through IPM. But uh, uh, like I said, it's great to be here. Some of you might be wondering, what does an intentional interim do anyways? And do we even need one? What's the big deal? Let's just go on with life and get our new pastor and, and get going. Well, an intentional interim's Ministry is to propel, prepare the church for the future. It's to pave the way for the next long-term senior pastor to come and to flourish for years, for years. At both of the churches I served out in California as interim, one stayed for over 10 years. Another is still there 14 years later. And so um, that's what an interim does. It helps kind of clear the decks. It helps rebuild trust. It helps... Um, Address issues that maybe have need to be addressed, and 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 being an outside guy, uh, I'm a little. I have a little uh, uh, an advantage of, hey, I'm not. I don't have a dog in the fight. You know, I just want to be here to serve, and I want to listen. And so that's what a lot of what an interim does is is the first couple of months I'm going to be here it would be simply asking a lot of questions, getting to know a lot of you, getting to know your stories, and. What really needs to be addressed as a church? What do we need to, uh, what needs to be resolved? What needs to be rebuilt? You know, where does the Lord need to bring refreshment and renewal in this season? The, um, um, and that's, that's really the heart of what an interim does. So I'm here to encourage, I'm here to, to, uh, to really help prepare the way for the future. But the other thing that I wanna say, and this was our attitude at the last two interims that we did, was like, this isn't pause button for the church. We're not just on pause for right now. We're going forward, full steam ahead. That's the, that's the, that's the heart of good interim ministry is 
church is church and we and people still need Jesus we need to worship Jesus we need to serve him so we're not just going to wait until the long-term senior pastor gets here we're going to keep going like you have been going so that's that's a little bit about interim what what I do um, recently I was out in California for a fix-it project um, on a rental home we've had for many years out there and usually I let our property manager take care of it but we got a bid on a fence repair that was damaged in the major storm and man it was expensive and I'm like you know I need to go a look at that so I flew out looked at the fence and you know I said I think I can do this so 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 that's that's what I was doing and when I do fix it projects I've done this for years um, I categorize them as a two three or a four okay if it's a, it does it take me two trips three trips or four trips to the hardware store to get that project done <laughs> yeah you know what that's like you know, the fence repair was a three. <laughs> One trip to Lowe's and two trips to Ace Hardware, and, and we, got it, we got it knocked out. But, you know, sometimes when you work on those projects, you get started, you know, you get all your tools, you get all your materials together, and you go, ah, I need something else. I don't have a, you know, an XYZ tool or a, or a part that you need. So you jump in the car, you head to the, the store to get what you need, and on the way, sometimes your mind drifts to, oh, wait, I got to do that project and that project and that. And you get to the store, you get, the, you get your cart out and you start pushing down the aisles and you start seeing everything. Oh man, that tool's on sale, you know? And sometimes you can even forget what you went to the store for in the first place. You get all this cool stuff. But the whole purpose you went to the store is to get that one part or that one tool. But it's easy to forget our original purpose. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, our original purpose about God's purpose for you and I. What does he want to do? Why are you and I here? What is his purpose for us? You know, I think this is a, a valuable topic to talk about at any stage of life. It really is, because just as we forget what part or tool we need at the store, we forget why we're here. And we get distracted, we get taken off course, we get excited about something, maybe a new hobby, or we move and we're doing remodeling or changes, you know, life changes can woo us away and distract us from our main purpose. This morning, I want to talk about God's purpose for us. And God's purpose, not our individual purpose for God in our lives, because we all have little unique spins on where God is calling each of us. But that overarching purpose, that one path, that one goal, that one dream that God has for all of us. And I want to try to answer the question, why are we here on planet Earth? What does God want us to do in this season while we're here? Because I believe this one overarching purpose, there's an answer for every one of us. And nothing inspires us, nothing propels us to get moving like a gripping sense of purpose. It really does. It seems like, though these days, everyone has an opinion on what our life purpose should be. You know, the uh, Dalai Lama, he says, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. But then Ralph Waldo Emerson says the purpose of our lives is not to be happy, it's to be useful. But then Taylor Swift, she says, no matter what happens in life, be good to people. So everybody's got an opinion, right, on what our purpose should be. But I want to look at how God answers that question. What does he have for us? Because nothing inspires us with a, like a gripping sense of purpose. It's really true. Anybody heard of the Westminster Confession or the longer and shorter catechism or larger and shorter catechism? Some of you, anybody raised Presbyterian, you know, that if you were a Presbyterian, you might know that. But in the 1600s, this was a document that was written by theologians of the day. And it was uh, written in a question and answer format, 107 questions and answers covering uh, basic doctrinal questions but the very first question number one on the list is simply this what is the chief end of man what is the chief end of man what's our purpose so then the answer is simply man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever to glorify God and enjoy him forever that's it that's the original purpose right there okay we can kind of like quit early if we want to but that's the main idea here Paul in Romans 11 says this, he says, for from, Paul writes this, he says, for from him and through him 
and for him are all things. And to him be the glory forever. The glory, there's the glory of God. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah says this in Isaiah 43. He said, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Isaiah says, hey, we were made to give glory to God. That's our purpose. That's our original purpose. Our chief end is to give glory to God and enjoy him forever. But what does that really mean anyways? And how does that inspire us in the first place? If this is our life purpose, how do we actually give glory to God? What are we supposed to do differently? And what is the glory of God anyways? The word glory today you know, it has kind of negative connotations, doesn't it? You know, you talk about somebody, oh, that guy's trying to get all the glory, you know, or that guy's a glory hog. You know, it's not good. It's not a, it's not a good sense. But if we really want to understand or have a life purpose that grips us and inspires us, we need to know what is the glory of God? What is God's glory anyways? Old Testament has some great definitions. The Old Testament word common uh, for the word glory, comes from the Hebrew word kavod. And kavod is a cool word. It means heaviness. It means weightiness. And metaphorically, it's greatness. It's splendor. It's majesty of God all rolled into this one concept, kavod, the heaviness of God. In the New Testament, the word for glory comes from the Greek word doxa. And doxa means um, a manifestation of light, of radiance, of brightness, of splendor. And so you have weightiness on the one hand and then this brightness describing the glory of God. So glory is both weightiness and radiance. You know, we, exceed, we see lots of examples of glory in the Bible as a demonstration of great power, of great power. But we also see the glory of God in the quietness of creation. Is it just in the quietness of creation? Well, let's take a look how God reveals his glory to us in great power. And we're going to, if you have your Bible, turn to Exodus 19, or you can cheat and look at the screen, you know, or pull out your device and, and pull it up. Exodus 19, I want us to look, what is the glory of God here? All right. Starting in verse 9, Moses says this, or the Lord said to Moses, rather, and this setting here, the children of Israel, they've just come out through the Red Sea. They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And they're headed into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And they stop at the foot of Mount Sinai. And some estimate that there's roughly 2 million Israelites there, okay? And so God's calling Moses to come up on the mountain, but the rest of the people are down below it. It says, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking to you and will always put their trust in you. And on the morning of the third day, down in verse 16, it says this, it says, and there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast and everyone in the camp trembled. I mean, can you just imagine? I mean, this cloud and the earthquake, I mean, it's just intense. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. It says, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with, in fire. And smoke was billowing up from this fire. I mean, it was just was crazy. This was just crazy. And it says, the whole mountain trembled violently. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. And the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. What were the people seeing? They were seeing the glory of God right there in front of them in power. I mean, and it was just intense. It was intense. And when Moses came down the mountain, he gave them the Ten Commandments, a few other commandments. And, uh, but skip over to, skipping over to chapter 24, he says this. Whoa. Chapter 24 says, When Moses went up on the mountain... And the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. Right there, right in front of them. I mean, what a display of his greatness, of his presence, right there. And it says, for six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. 
and to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. Can you imagine seeing these flames just pouring up into the sky and the, and the smoke billowing up? When I was a kid, I grew up in a little beach town of Santa Barbara, just north of Los Angeles. And it was brutal in Santa Barbara. No, I'm just kidding. It was really nice. The, uh, we were a few miles from the beach. But we lived right on the edge of a, a big mountain range. And I remember one year when I was about seven years old, there was a huge fire. And so we could see flames all across the mountain. Now, it was nothing like Mount Sinai, but it was pretty crazy. You know, in the smoke. And, and, and it, was, it was just a fraction of what this is. But... Um, these guys, it was, it was crazy. It says, For six days the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from the cloud. To the Israelites the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire. And then Moses entered the cloud as, any, as he went up on the mountain. And he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Well, during that 40 days and 40 nights, God was downloading to Moses what the tabernacle should be, this, this portable worship center what it's going to look like and how you need to design it and how you need to care for it and the Ark of the Covenant and what that's going to look like. So he gave Moses all this detail. So Moses comes down from the mountain and they end up building this tabernacle, this tent uh, worship center. Skip over to Exodus 40. In Exodus 40, it says this, uh, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Could you imagine? So this massive brightness is inside this tent, this massive glory of God. And it says, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, it says, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud, whoops. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and it was a fire by night. So pillar of cloud by day, and a cloud uh, or a pillar of fire at night. And it says, in the sight of the Israelites all through their travels. The glory of God was right there. This had to be unbelievable. Okay, the Israelite camp, as many of you know, they would set up the tabernacle, this tent compound, right in the middle of where they were camping. And then they would camp around in a radius around the, the, the tabernacle by tribe. So you'd have the different 12 tribes of Israel were in their kind of camping neighborhoods. But everywhere you camped, everywhere your tent was, you could look to the tabernacle and see the presence of God right there. Every day for 40 years. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. There were no atheists in that crowd. Not at all. I mean, not with something like that. Skip over to Exodus or to Leviticus 9. Leviticus 9. Moses and Aaron, it says, went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. I mean, it was probably this massive blinding light behind uh, Aaron and, uh, and Moses. But they came out of the temple, or not temple, the tabernacle, and there was a big altar in front. It was like a big seven foot by seven foot barbecue is what the altar was, where they would offer animal sacrifices to the Lord. And you know, when you're barbecuing meat, you know, you put the wood or the charcoal or whatever in there and you or fire up the gas, and it takes a while for the meat to cook, right? Well, not, not here. It says this. It says... Uh, you know, as they're presenting sacrifices, it says fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar. And when the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. I mean, here Moses and Aaron, you know, they're standing in front of this altar thing, okay? And, and they've got the meat and everything all ready to situate it or to, to offer it to God. And then flames come out from the other side, from inside the tabernacle, and just descend on that thing and whoosh, it's gone. It's gone. The Lord took it. And the people were, were just blown away. This was the glory of God. They witnessed the glory of God. Psalm 63, King David writes this. He says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and I beheld 
your glory, your power and your glory. One working definition of glory is simply this, an unmistakable demonstration of the presence and power of God. An unmistakable demonstration of the presence and power of God. In the New Testament, we also see the glory of God. In, uh, in Luke 2, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 2. I don't have a slide for it. But in Luke 2, the shepherds are out in the fields watching over the, the sheep, uh, their flocks. And Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are in the manger nearby. And it says this in verse 8. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. They were terrified. So here's these guys out, you know, watching their sheep, keeping wolves away and not letting runaways, you know, happen. And this angel shows up, massive bright glory around this angel. They're scared spillless. You know, this was, this was intense. The glory of the Lord was right there. It shone around them. But he said this, the angel said to them, but do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Years ago, I had the chance to go to, to Israel just for a few days. I was there for meetings, and we actually ditched the meetings one day, my buddy and I, and did a little tour of, uh, around Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And so we saw this field outside of Bethlehem. And, all the, and there was a hillside with all these caves in it that many scholars believe that that's where Jesus was born, in a manger inside one of those caves. And it was, it was just amazing. But verse 13, it says this, it says, suddenly, so here's one angel, bright lights, shepherds scared, and the angel saying, hey, calm down, calm down. But then suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests. Thousands of angels showed up right there. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable sight. The glory of God was present in a profound way. But now what about glory today? You know, when you and I see glory today, not necessarily the glory of God, but human glory, it's very different. You know, when world leaders, they parade their, their, their military might uh, they, to, uh, to show their prestige and display their own glory, their own greatness, their own power. Hitler did it. Stalin did it. Uh, Putin did it. Kim Jong-un did it. Even in Star, uh, Star Wars, Darth Vader did it. You know, in Lord of the Rings, Saruman did it. But theirs was not an unmistakable demonstration of the presence and power of God. Nothing like that. There's pales in comparison. But that's human glory. That's what we see in many ways. So today we see in the Old Testament how God revealed himself and the new. God reveals his glory in great power. But he also reveals his glory to us in the quietness of creation. Psalm 19.1 says this, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of of his hands. Well, what's he talking about? Beautiful sunsets. That's the glory of God. That's a display of the glory of God. Magnificent cloud uh, formations, or the aurora borealis, or a summer night that's just aglow with stars, or a bright full moon. All of those are flashing the glory of God. That's the glory of God. Numbers 14.21 says, The glory of the Lord fills the whole earth. It fills the whole earth. When you think about the vast oceans, the glory of God. Or majestic mountain ranges, the glory of God. Anybody been to Yosemite Valley? The glory of God. Years ago, when Kirsten and I were first married, she said, hey, we should go to Yosemite. And I said, yeah, you know, I've never been to Yosemite before you know i'm 30 years old we got married a little bit older and uh lived in california my whole life i was actually born in canada eh? so i was born in toronto and uh but we moved to california when i was like one and so that's pretty much all i've known but my family we used to go on vacation to lake tahoe that was our big deal my mom and dad they loved 
ka-ching, the slot machines and the casinos in Lake Tahoe. You know, and so that we get both. We get nature and then we get mom and dad to be able to go to the casino. So Kirsten's family, on the other hand, was more, you know, altruistic. They went to Yosemite and camped and uh, uh, all growing up as a, as a little girl. And so she couldn't wait for me to experience Yosemite. <clears throat> and so we're like, you know, 30, 31, got our old Toyota Corolla all loaded up, got our bike rack on the back, got our mountain bikes, got our, our tent we got for a wedding present. And... So we're cruising into Yosemite, and you come around this one bend, and there's a pullout there, because that's when you first see the valley. And you, the reason there's a pullout, because you would have cars smacking into each other, because it is just, it blows you away. You pull around the corner, and boom, this valley, this giant, massive granite cliff of El Capitan is right there. And on the other side, you have a half dome. You know, and all the falls. I mean, it's just amazing. But it's the glory of God because God is the designer. God is, God is the creator. And that's his glory on display in the whole earth. The glory of the Lord fills the whole earth. But that's just a snapshot, really, of what the glory of God is. So how do we give glory to God, really? I mean, on one sense, it's a... whoop. Getting ahead of myself. In one sense, you know, how in the world can we contribute to the glory God already has? I mean, we're chump change, right? No. No, you and I can give glory to God. It's something we can actually tangibly give to him. Glory. One of my good friends, Warren, was a vice president for Taco Bell, uh, for mar vice, vice president of marketing for Taco Bell for years. And uh, he, had a, he has a lot of great Taco Bell stories. Remember the little chihuahua guy, yo quiero Taco Bell, you know, um, there are some really good ones, but um, anyhow, uh, but Warren was an expert in understanding what motivates and drives people, being a marketing guy, and one time he told me, he said, you know, people are motivated by one of three things, the three G's, the three G's, some of you know what the three G's are, gold, glory, or God, motivated by, by gold, by money, is what fuels us. Glory, we want the fame. Or God, something like a higher purpose. One of those three. But what God's word's telling us today is let God's glory be your higher purpose. Let God's glory be your higher purpose. The ultimate motivating force in our lives. You see, God is glorified when we see him as he truly is. And we respond accordingly. When we see him as he truly is, and then we respond according. He is glorified. Two words, two cool Greek words in the New Testament that help us understand how we glorify God. The first one is megaluno. Megaluno means to declare great, um, to enlarge, to increase. That's, another, that's a key idea around giving glory to God that we declare him great, that we enlarge, or increase um, who he is. Number two is doxaso. Doxaso means giving high status to or enhancing the reputation of. That's, uh, that's doxaso. In other words, we're really talking about when we give glory to God, it's how to make him famous, how to expand his reputation. Now, why do we even need to do that? I mean, don't people know who God is? No, they don't. They really don't know who he is. He's not Santa Claus. He's not the old man upstairs. You know, he's Jehovah. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. And we glorify God in two primary ways, two key ways. Number one, through our worship. Through our worship. Psalm 69 says this, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Praise him in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The psalmist here is talking about true worship where we give back to God. You see, when we declare in song how great and awesome he is, we're giving worship and giving glory to God. You know, we don't do a lot of teaching in, in church on worship these days. We do a lot of worship, 
but we don't teach a lot on it. But true worship, hap true worship happens. True worship happens when we really believe the words that we're singing and they flow out of our heart at full velocity. When we believe what we're singing and they flow out of our heart at full velocity, regardless of whether the style of music is our preference or not. It's the words. It's the words. And true worship happens when we really connect with the words and sing them right up to the throne of God. God is glorified. You and I can give something to God, our worship. We can give glory to him by our worship. Okay, now I know in northern Indiana here that there are a mix of football fans, right? It's not monolithic. Are there some Colts fans? Any Colts fans here? There's some Detroit or Lions fans here. There's even some Bears fans here. Bears fans? Yeah. Okay. Now, I've heard, rumor has it, there's even some Packers fans here in northern Indiana. So I'm a Packers fan. No, uh, no denying that. And for me, true worship is kind of like sitting on the 50-yard at Lambeau. You're sitting on the 50-yard at Lambeau during a playoff game, and the Packers are down by four points with five seconds on the clock. I mean, it's just intense, you know, by four points, five seconds on the clock. It's fourth down. Jordan Love takes a snap. He drops back, drills it to Aaron Lazard in the end zone. Touchdown. What happens next? Well, at Lambeau erupts. The stadium just erupts in praise of victory. I mean, it's amazing. Hearts are spilling over with shouts of acclamation. Nobody's complaining about that boring halftime show. Nobody's complaining about the stale beer, you know, or what happened or didn't happen in the second quarter. They won, and that's all that matters. That's it. You know, and in many ways, that's a lot like a worship service could be with that level of enthusiasm with that level of praise. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Never let the style of music stop you from worshiping the Lord. Never let it stop you from worshiping the Lord. So number one, we bring glory to God by our worship. Number two, we glorify God by our attitude and how we live. We glorify God in our attitude by how we live. When we live in a way that points to God's goodness and compassion. First, or First Corinthians 10.31 says this. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. So what does that include? Pretty much everything, okay? Everything you do. What God's word is saying here is now, I want you to refocus why you're doing your job, why you're caring for your kids, why you're loving your neighbors. To do it in a way that gives glory to God. That's what he's saying. Jesus said in Matthew 5.16, he says this, he says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, it's interesting, he doesn't say they may see your good deeds and think how cool you are. No, that they may see your good deeds how you're loving, how you're caring, your compassion. And they'll glorify God in heaven. Peter says the same thing, very similar thing in, in 1 Peter 2. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. When we glorify God, rather we glorify God when we live in a way that makes him famous when we live in a way that makes him famous. And God is made famous when people see his followers as beaming, radiant examples of his goodness, of his compassion, of his love. We glorify God by how we live. So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. Well, it's no secret that I love pizza. Okay, I do. I just, it's a... Uh, you could call it a spiritual gift. No, not really. <laughs> Don't call it a spiritual gift. <laughs> but a well-known pizza place where I live up in uh, Waukesha is called Marty's Pizza. And Marty's Pizza, and they make really good pizza. But after one of our ser services at Elmbrook Church, where I just served, a Marty's Pizza delivery guy came up to one of my colleagues, 
And he recently went to one of our No Regrets Men's Conferences that we host every year. And, uh, and he told him, man, I, I went to the conference and I loved it. And so my colleague could tell he was kind of newer to faith. And so he asked him, how did you start coming to Elmbrook? How did you start coming to Elmbrook? And well, he said, you know, I, I work for Marty's Pizza and I've delivered a lot of pizzas to Elmbrook <laughs> over the years. And he says, every time, they've been, everyone's been so nice to me and so kind. It blew them away. And so I had to come and check it out. What's going on here? Why are people so different? Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? It was the everyday kindness, the God-glorifying kindness that drew him to the Lord, our pizza delivery guy. And that was awesome. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Will you bow with me in, in prayer? Father, thank you. Thank you for including us in your plan of glory, Lord, that we can even give something back to you, that we can glorify you, that we can praise you. And we just thank you. I pray, Lord, right now, I just entrust River Oaks to you, the River Oaks family, that you would move in this next season in such a powerful way that we would bring glory to you like never before. God, that this would be a new season, a refreshed season. Lord, to bring in glory to you in whatever we do, we pray. And thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen.